back here. Okay. Yes, <laughs> I don't see a very big response, so I'm actually uh, uh, they're not sure. Yeah, they're not. <laughs> okay. Uh, if everyone would please go with me to Psalm 146. The people in the front are not hearing you. <laughs> It looks like they have victory. 
it looks like they're going to win. And to his people, they trust Pharaoh, they're following him into the sea. It looks like it's over for the Israelites. And in a moment like that, they're done. Pharaoh's plans are thwarted, they're ruined. And their plans perish with Pharaoh. And that is the way of someone who puts their plans in this world, who puts their trust in something in this world. Because the minute that dies, so do your plans. Now what do we mean by trust? I've defined trust uh, for our use today as a sincere belief and commitment in the reliability of God's character, His person and His work. A belief in who God is and what He's doing, and also a commitment to that belief being worked out in your life. And to illustrate this, I would like you to think of a child. I know not an 18 year old child, like, <laughs> or a child like me, but a 5 year old, a 7 year old. Has your child ever come home and said, Oh, Mom, I haven't earned my wages today. What are we going to eat? Oh, how are we going to pay rent? I haven't worked hard enough this month to actually pay the rent. Oh, Mom, we need to go buy clothes. The only time they really wonder about what we're going to eat is not whether they're going to eat, but when they get hungry. And they trust their parents to feed them. Right? So we should be with God, in a sense. Our trust should be in the one true and living God, our Heavenly Father, to take care of us and to feed us. Yet we put our trust in the world. If you would please turn with me to Matthew 6. We'll quickly be reading from verse 25 all the way to verse 34. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will or what you will what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, nor gather together in barns. And yet, your Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet, I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O ye of, o ye, you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And you and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God, or a kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, 
Now here we can see who God is and that God is the one that cares for you. God is the one that loves you, that feeds you, that gives you something to drink. He's the one that cares for the flowers of the field and for the birds of the air. And we are to put our trust in God. As we were to put our trust in our parents, in a father that would care for his children. Because our Heavenly Father is a good father. And he does care for us. And he does feed us. And he does love us. And the difference is his, him feeding us and him caring for us is so much different than the idols of this world. Now what do I mean? Well, what, what's one of the most common idols? I think it's most likely the idol of self. If I want anything done right, I must do it myself. Type of mentality. It's all surrounded around me. Now, um, I don't know if any of you have had this experience, probably, where you've really been sure of something and you're going to do it. We, we experienced it the other day, going to Bloemfontein and hitting a donkey. We were sure we were going, and we were sure that it's going to be a, a nice, easy ride. We would come back in the same, on the same day, and then the donkey. And the car hit the donkey, and it sort of just messed up all our plans. And after that, it just, yeah, it was a big hassle, and the plan sort of just fell apart. We only got to Bloemfontein after, I think, 2 o'clock. We spent five hours at our first place, and we tried driving back at night again afterwards. And um, we only got home, I think, at 1. Now, that's, that wasn't a good day. The idol of self is truly a scary thought because we don't realize that the idol of self only works until something goes wrong. It only works until your, plan, your plans just fall apart. And more often than not, they do fall apart. Yet we put our faith and our trust in this. If I only work harder, if I only do this one thing, then okay, everything will work out. But no, if your house is not built on the foundation of God and you're trusting Him, your house is going to fall apart because it's reliant on you. Right? Like Pharaoh. His plans fell apart in an instant when God said no. But our trust is to be in God, the true and living God, and not in these idols. There are many more idols like this, like literal presidents and princes, in our bosses. And as you know now, I'm sure if you all know at least one person who, have lost, who has lost their job in the time of this pandemic. Your job can fail you. If your trust is in that, well, it can drop you in an instant. But our trust is to be in God. And why can we put our trust in God? Now, I've said this a couple of times. It's the same reason why we are to love God. It's the same reason why we are to fear God. It's the same reason why we are to praise God and we are, why we are to worship God. It's because of who God is and what God has done. God is holy. God is righteous. God is just. He's almighty. And God does not die. So His plans don't die. He is the one who destroys the plans of the wicked. He is the one who upholds justice. He, have, he protects the sojourner. He is the one who does this. He upholds the fields. As you drive on the N1, 
and you look at the beautiful fields and the beautiful man mountains, God is the one who upholds all of that. And therefore you can trust Him because He has never failed to do so. Because this is who God is. He is not like the idols who the minute, with the minute when times get hard, all their plans just fall apart. Now do you put your trust in this God? Or are you the man that has now put your trust in yourself? In the idols of this world? Can you trust God? Or do you trust God? You can. And you must. Now this leads us to our second part of our definition. What does the commitment mean? What effect does this trust in God have on me as a Christian? Well, like Paul to, in, the letters to the, in the letter to the Philippians, he has a peace that is beyond understanding. He has a peace because his trust is not found in the inheritance of this world, but a peace that is found in God and His truth. And this leads him to be content with what God has given him. When he says that I have had much and I have also had little. And this coming from Paul, a man that, who has been beaten, who has been thrown in prison, yet he can have a joy as he expresses to the Philippians. And such a great, great joy. And this is the effect of trust in God. Why? Because it's not found in the outside things. It's not found in your circumstances. It's found in who God is and what He is doing. Now how grateful it must be for men who put their trust in these other things. What effect should that have? Well, they should have no hope. They should have no peace. Why? Because while your plans can fall apart. There's no salvation found in the plans of the princes. They can de disappear in an instant. And we see that in Pharaoh. The other day I was speaking to another pastor. And I have respect for this pastor. He is at least willing to tell me what he believes. Now, this man was very willing to say that, Clinton, if a rock hits you on the head and you die right now, God could plan for you to be alive and you be dead. That could have been God's plan. And it might probably was God's plan. This pastor was willing to say that God doesn't know anything ahead of time because that would be wicked. Because he doesn't do every, you know, he doesn't do everything to stop all these wicked things from happening. And he used a couple of very dreadful examples. Can you see the sadness there? How do you trust God if He can't do anything? Because that would be wicked of Him. If He's not allowed to do anything. My friends, we don't worship a God like that. We worship a God that upholds His purposes. He upholds His plans and He brings them forth. It's not dependent on the world, it's not dependent on your circumstances, but it's utterly dependent on Him. And how dreadful that must be for this man because well, then where else can your hope be? Now that's, that's just in the Christian world. How dreadful it must be for the men outside of the church who don't put their trust in God at all. I think that man was very inconsistent. 
Because there's a sense in which he does trust God. Right? He has to, otherwise he's not a Christian. But for your atheist, how dreadful it must be for his family. Because he can die at any moment and then, what about them? They can die at any moment and then all the plans and all his hopes, all his dreams, they just fall apart. Don't let your trust and your hope be found in those things. But let them be found in God. In His kingdom and in His righteousness. We have an inheritance that is eternal that cannot be taken away from us. Because it is in the hands of the one and only true and living God. To illustrate this to you again, just think of the Philippian letter. There is so much joy from a man that has been beaten so many times. That has been put in prison so many times. And has gone through so much persecution. Yet he still has this wonderful joy and peace. Why? Well, because he knows that his inheritance is not found in his circumstances. But it is found in the one and true living God. In Acts 5, we see the apostles being arrested, and then they get out of prison, but then being brought back, and they were questioned, and they were beaten, and they were charged not to preach in the name of Christ. And what did they do? Well, they went out and they praised God because they were worthy to suffer persecution for the name of the Lord Jesus. Those are men who trust God whose peace is not found in their circumstances, but in the true and living God. And Paul and Silas in Acts 16, when they're in prison and they're singing hymns and they're praying, and a Philippian jailer gets saved, after being beaten, and being tossed in a cell. How wonderful for me to have a hope and a peace like that. My friends, don't, don't let your hope be found in this world. Because there's nothing, there's nothing really there. Now we can have a hope and we can have a peace in this world, but that is on the foundation of the true and living God. So we've defined trust as we're coming to our conclusion. We have defined trust as a sincere belief and commitment to the truth of God's character, His person, and His work. And that is where our trust is supposed to be. With all that said, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you today, we pray that you would be with us. Lord, as a father of his children, or that you would be the one to care for us. Lord, that we won't find our hope and our peace in the things of this world, Lord, but that we would find it so in you. Lord, thank you for all your wonderful grace and mercy. Thank you that you have taken us out of our sins and brought us into your wonderful light. And Lord, please work in us that we could see and the world could see our trust in you 
looked up. We thank you 